you know, this is digital, a lot of the conversation is social, especially with the, with the panelists we have here, a very social media savvy bunch. So uh, Melanie, you want to start and we'll go down the road? Sure. Um, so I'm Melanie, I'm Director of Communications for Opia Talk which is in a startup in the e-commerce space. We're out of Betamore in Fed Hill. And I work on our thought leadership and content marketing. So my job is to drive leads through content. And I do that primarily on LinkedIn. Take it away from me. <laughs> I am Courtney Pomerantz. I work at LinkedIn in the marketing solutions department. Um, so I, LinkedIn is split up by vertical. I handle a lot of the media and entertainment clients. Um, you know, all in the, if you're not familiar with LinkedIn, Marketing Solutions is most of the, kind of the advertising space. Um, there's Talent Solutions and Sales Solutions, which are totally different departments on LinkedIn. Um, and I'm, I'm Rebecca Foss. Can you hear this okay? Uh, uh, Rebecca Foss. I'm the Director of Social Media at University of Maryland, mm -hmm. University College. Um, it is the online arm of the University System of Maryland. Uh, not a traditional college. Our students are a little bit older, working adults. So, um, we use different social media platforms to uh, target our different audiences. And uh, so, Rebecca, I want to start with you. Uh, you've got a lot of varied experience. You spent a long time on the brand side, you know, yeah. Geico, you know, you're on the agency side, you know, uh, now in academia. Uh, how does being a marketer within academia compare to your other experience, and, and what's consistent and, and what's different about it? Um, well, so my primary background is in marketing and primarily brand marketing uh, when I was with Geico. But funny enough, I'm not really in marketing at University of Maryland, University College. I'm in communications. So uh, the challenge is really to sort of pull all of the pieces together uh, from all across the university because there's a lot of push and pull between marketing and you know our academic side, thought leadership, um, and start to you know s you know just realize what you know how we use these platforms and social media as a whole as a conversation tool and a way to create an engaged audience. Yeah, uh, and so so what would you say your uh, uh, what would you say has been the biggest surprise then going over to the communication side and and this very different kind of organization? Um, you know, when I first got to UMUC, I thought, am I in the wrong department? I should be in marketing. <laughs> but I really, um, as, I, as I worked there for, uh, for a little while, I realized that um, as a university, it's a very different industry uh, than the, you know, typical consumer or brand product. So uh, working at Geico was, you know, somewhat acceptable in social media to sell a little bit, whereas in, um, in academia, it's not quite as acceptable, and you have to you have a very fine line that you have to be careful not to cross. So it was a lot of discovery and trying to figure out um, what would be the best way to approach our different audiences without offending people, and with also trying internally to like sort of solve everybody's problem, you know, solve everybody's goal or meet everybody's goals and objectives. Uh, and so, uh, so Courtney, then for you with. LinkedIn, uh, uh, what would you say is the biggest misconception you've come across day to day? Um, it's funny, we were actually talking about this uh, a little while ago. <laughs> I think the biggest misconception um, is that people think that, well, number one, a lot of people mentioned they think LinkedIn's on, only B2B, there's no B2C, it's actually now both. People also don't totally understand um, the power of LinkedIn. You know, they don't understand that LinkedIn isn't just for jobs. That's the the, the number one thing I still hear, um, LinkedIn is a great source for, you know, uh, finding a job. However, LinkedIn has also become a powerhouse for content. Um, LinkedIn gives you an amazing opportunity to push content out there um, to not only help you sell a product, but to help you, you know, create that awareness, become that thought leader, and really teach people about your company. Um, and I think that a lot people don't understand that LinkedIn can do that. They don't. They don't always see um, how LinkedIn does that because a lot of people still think of LinkedIn as just a job tool, you know, to help you find a job. And I've got to preface this. One one of the things that surprised me when I was speaking to the panelists before was that there wasn't a direct connection among them. And so it, it's going to be a very convenient segue. Note that LinkedIn is not a sponsor of this session. It's, this is all just very. <laughs> Organic, but uh, but now, given what Courtney just said, I, uh, I'd, I'd love for you to share your experience with using 
LinkedIn for content marketing and actually that turning into some real business? So. Yeah. So um, I started at Opia Talk in January, but I wasn't full time until April. And when I was looking at our content marketing strategy and our social media strategy as a whole, I made a strategic decision early on to essentially ignore Facebook and Twitter because I only had so much bandwidth as the entire marketing and communications department, which is me. Um, so I decided to focus all of my efforts on LinkedIn and that's partly because our CEO, Tom, had a lot of success early on using LinkedIn as a platform. He built our entire board of advisors and our board of directors, including the former CIO of the New York Times from LinkedIn job posts and just connecting, sending in mails, things like that. At the time that I started at Opia Talk, literally in April or May, and you can probably correct me if I'm wrong, LinkedIn rolled out publishing to everyone on its platform. That meant that not just influencers, but anyone that was a member of LinkedIn could publish content on LinkedIn. Um, I come from a, marketing, a content marketing background, so I saw the utility right away in doing content marketing on LinkedIn. And one of the reasons that I like it, I also write for Huffington Post and a, a bunch of other outlets, but what I like about LinkedIn is I can control what time of day it's published, what my image is going to be, um, what I'm going to say at the end. There's a lot of control that I have on LinkedIn that I don't have elsewhere. So I started writing articles and a few of them went viral, including one about my former job at Uber. Some of you might have read it. Has, has anyone read this? Does it sound familiar? It was called The Truth About What It's Like Working at Uber. And it became one of the top posts on LinkedIn. I think it was third or fourth, I forget. Um, and it got 180,000 views and we got 50 inbound leads in two days, which was more than two salespeople in three months. So um, you can't, I mean, I'm, I can tell you right now that you can't predict when something is going to go viral, but you can create the elements that could have it go viral, um, and that was what I was trying to do. And I embedded Opia Talk in that article, like, here's where I used to work, here's where I work now, and that worked really well. So now, I mean, we're a startup, so we're constantly iterating, but I would say this is our primary marketing strategy at the moment, and we're getting um, other members of the team involved too. So our content strategy is to write about, write to our strengths, write about things that we think the LinkedIn audience is going to be interested in, and then embed Opia Talk in the article itself, instead of just at the end in italics. I had to, I, sorry, I just no, to jump on. in with this. Um, you, you're correct. It was, it was rolled out to where anybody on LinkedIn can actually publish you know, long form content. Um, it wasn't everybody at the time. You probably were just one of the lucky few. It's now rolled out to almost everybody. I don't know if they've finally rolled it out to everyone. But it also gets back to a misconception is that what you're doing is brilliant. It's, it's what everybody should be doing with content marketing. It's teaching someone something. It's educating without selling. So the thing about content marketing that's, that's so big and that, you know, I don't have a content background. You know, I have, I started in the TV side and moved over to digital and, you know, it's everything that you're learning. A lot of what we do at LinkedIn, even on the advertising side is educating because so much is now centered around content marketing. And if you can do it the right way, like what you did, where you do write a piece of content and you don't just talk about the product or just talk about the company, but you, you put it in there in the right way you're going to see amazing performance and amazing results. And I think that's where LinkedIn is a great platform for that um, because you have the ability to do that. I, and I, I mean, that, that was the crazy thing for me <laughs> when, when really uh, diving into what happened here because it's not just that, yeah, it's like something went viral on, on LinkedIn. I, you know, I do read posts on LinkedIn a fair amount. There's, there's a lot of great stuff there, but just how well that you were able to track how that compared to what sales people are. I, I mean, it, 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 did, did that even ruffle any feathers on the sales team or was everyone on board with that? No, I mean, I, it's, a small, it's a small team and we're all rooting for the company, so we don't really care where the leads are coming in. And the nice thing about inbound leads is that they're motivated to talk to you, they reached out to you, they want what you're selling instead of trying to get them to call you back. And I think that's where 
after that article in particular, we took a step back and said, how can we replicate this with more members of the team instead of spending time doing the cold outreach? Because cold outreach, I think, honestly, I think it's, it's going to become obsolete at some point. Like, I think it's going to be more and more drawing people in instead of trying to get, get them, get their attention. Yeah, and if you have more questions about how well that worked, I, I do too. I, I you know, want to cover a little more ground, but, uh, but feel free, you know, uh, just raise your hand or you know, during Q&A, we can start it whenever. But Rebecca, I, I want to go to you and, and ask you about the kinds of platforms you're focused on and, uh, a, a, and even just broadly, I mean, this doesn't just have to be about social. But I mean, where in digital media are you and your organization really investing a lot of your, your time and effort? Um, well, you know, we're investing a lot into our website right now. There's a whole redesign being done. Um, and on social media, we're doing, um, we're, we're kind of looking at every platform. And, and our audience is so broad. Uh, we know that our audience uh, usually is over the age of 25. So, uh, and it could be all the way up to the, you know, 50, 55, 56 years old, people going back to school. Um, working full time. So what platforms are those people on? Well, they could be on Instagram, they could be on Facebook, they could be on Twitter. Um, we use LinkedIn. It's a great platform as well. Um, I love the university pages. Uh, that's our, probably where we can get our messaging across the most to our alumni and our students that are currently attending. Um, so if we have like some good news, um, like today we uh, our cyber security Com competitive team won the global uh, round in Barcelona. So we'll post that on our LinkedIn page. We're excited. We're the number one cybersecurity team in the, in the world. So um, we'll get that out to all of our alumni and our students and hope that um, you know, they'll share that news and things like that. So, so, um, so that university page is a great platform for us because it, it automatically pulls in everyone that lists uh, UMUC on their education section. And, and to that end, are, are there things like, like, even if you're not sharing specific numbers, are there things where, yep. you know, like if it, if it gets a certain amount of likes or shares or something, then it's good and, uh, I mean, how do you optimize around this regardless of where you're publishing? Yeah, so, um, you know, we're, we have a cha we have some budgetary cha challenges and things like that. So we we don't have huge budgets to optimize our social media efforts and you know. So we we do have small budgets and we look at what content is out there that we might want to promote. So um, if something like this comes up, I might recommend like, hey, let's promote this piece of content. Let's go out there and you know spread the news to people beyond our audience. Um, stuff like that. Great. Uh, and so then. Uh, Courtney, when when you're having conversations about LinkedIn as more than a job site and and even just more than typical media property, it, it is it just the idea that uh, uh, you that if people are posting more and the or the brands are posting more, then okay they'll advertise more and promote those posts and it's like that kind of cause effect thing, or is it just right now all about sucking people in and trying to just get them to invest more of their efforts broadly? Like, like what's, what's your end game when you're having these conversations with marketers? You know, I mean, I think it depends on who you're talking to. I mean, I mean of course, me personally, I, I mean, I'm always going to want to get the budgets <laughs> in. I mean, I work in the advertising team. <laughs> However, a lot of what LinkedIn does and what I do is also just educating clients because LinkedIn is such a powerful platform and, you know, it, it's a company that I'm so proud to work at. And, you know, we can help companies even if it is just, you know, and we were actually talking about this earlier, even if it is just organic posting, I am more than happy to, to talk to clients and educate people about this is what you should do first because a lot of the times we, when I am talking to a client and they might have budget issues or budget concerns, I always say start, create a company page, get your company out there, you know, start posting content, you do all this for free. This is all organic. And then from there, you know, stay in touch. I can help you you know, I can kind of, my team can help teach and educate on this is what you should be doing because I think that what you'll find, and this is what happens a lot of the time with, with meetings that I have, is, you know, once you, you're out there, you'll see that, you know, it's being heard and it's being, people are really paying attention and they're, they're on LinkedIn for a reason and it's not just, you know, it's not just the job site. They're there to really, to really better themselves because if you think about why you're on LinkedIn, you're there to create kind of this professional identity and you're there to whether it be to 
connect with someone because you really want to do that in the future or to better yourself right now by, you know, reading content or, you know, whatever it may be. I think it's always important for companies to be there and to be kind of front and center in front of the audience that you're looking to reach, whether it's organic or paid. Uh, and, and so is there any business out there that like, doesn't need to be on LinkedIn? I mean, does every single business need to be there? Does every single yes. person <laughs> need to be there? I, I, mean, I mean, I don't want to say every person needs to be on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. I do believe every business should be on LinkedIn because mm -hmm. that's what... I mean, LinkedIn is a place for companies to, it's a place for you to get someone to raise their hand and say, I want to hear more about you without being in your face. Like, I just want to sell you a product. If you think about, you know, when you say a company might be advertising somewhere else, you know, it's just a, it's a display ad or whatever it may be. And, you know, not social, social networks, but maybe other, other publisher sites. I think it's very important for companies to have a presence on LinkedIn, um, even if it is just a small presence. You know, I think it's it's a way to to get your message out there to people that are they're interested. They're there for a reason. They're there. You know, it's in a trusted environment. Um, I don't want to say every person needs to be on LinkedIn. You know, it depends on what you're doing or where you want to go. Um, LinkedIn's goal is to get kind of the entire global workforce on LinkedIn. Um, we're, uh, you know, about 50% there with over 300 million members. You know, LinkedIn, I think, is growing at like two members a, per second. Um, so I think it just depends on, it depends on, as an individual, depends on what you want to do and where you want to go. As a company, I think it's very important for everyone to have a presence on LinkedIn. I just want to go back real quick to... Uh, pushing content, so investing in advertising on, on a platform like LinkedIn. So um, I agree that content marketing really shouldn't be about your product very much, it should be about other things. However, I will say that there should be at least one post that's just about your product. So I wrote a post called the best conversion hack you've never heard of. Um, we're a B2B company. If you're in e-commerce, you're always interested in conversion. You want to know, how do I get more people to buy on my site? I want to convert. I want to convert. So I knew it would get the attention of the right people. And it was basically five points about opiate talk. This is the best conversion hack you've never heard of. We're an upstart startup. No one's heard of us, literally, so I was pretty sure no one would hear of it. Um, that piece, so one of the KPIs that I look at when I'm doing content marketing is how many shares am I getting per view? So a lot of my pieces get around 5%, which means that 5 in 100 people are, are looking at it and then they're sharing it with their network. To me, that's really important because that's the biggest vote of confidence I can have on a piece of content that I write. Um, some of the pieces have been as low as 2 or 3%. That piece, the, the best conversion hack you never heard of, had a 30% share rate. So it didn't have very many views. It had like 1,000 views or 1,500 views. But out of the 1,500 views, 500 people were sharing it with their networks. And you can bet that those were all e-commerce people. So when we saw that crazy high share rate, that was when we decided to invest in that particular piece of content. So we pushed it to a bunch more e-commerce professionals using the LinkedIn advertising. And that has been a major part of our marketing budget. And we saw inbound leads off that article for at least two and a half months, consistently, every single week. So I think for someone like me who's creating a lot of content all the time, I'm not just going to push everything. I'm going to see how much traction I can get with my organic traffic. I published the Uber piece for free. I didn't push it at all. And then if the shares are really high and I can see there's engagement in the community I'm looking for, I'm going to push that piece because I know it's working. So I think it is important to target some of the content that you're putting out there. And I also think it's important especially somewhere like LinkedIn, like don't be afraid to have at least one piece that's just about what you do, especially if you're a new company or you're trying to get the word out because the people that are interested in that will share it if it's a new thing in that industry. And, and so how big a deal is it for it to come from Opia Talk versus Melanie? So I don't actually know if you can write a long form post from a company page, can you? No. You can't write no, a long right. post right now from a company page. You can put page. it onto the company page. You can put it on the company yeah. page, but you can't publish it from the company page. So um, this is actually uh, kind of a thing because <laughs> I have my own brand separate from Opia Talk, which I can't really use right now because I've branded my LinkedIn profile to Opia Talk. 
Um, and so I would love to see that at some point figured out. <laughs> if we can publish from company pages, pass it along, um, that would be really helpful because right, right now there is no way to do that. But in some cases, wouldn't you like? I think in a lot of cases, maybe not the maybe not the post you're talking about where it's five points about opiate talk. You want that those posts to come from a person as opposed to the company because it really sort of shows, um, you know, like for, in our case, it shows that we have expertise in certain areas or things. Like here's a faculty member that's writing something, or as opposed to hey, it's coming from this university that nobody knows where, you know, mm -hmm. or who's writing it. So. No, I definitely think it's more personal, and it also allows a certain branding of each of the people that are writing on our like on our mm -hmm. team. I. I'm a millennial and I write about millennials from my LinkedIn page. So we have a whole series about millennials and that comes from me and I've got a sort of brand going around that. Tom, our CEO, writes about startups and what it's like to be at a startup, to be running a startup, and that's sort of branded to him. So when we have sort of the more hardcore e-commerce style pieces, which sometimes I'll go straight, sometimes he'll write them, um, we'll publish those from his platform. If it's about millennials or something more personal, I'll post it. So I, I do think there's an advantage to um, personal branding when it comes to a company because a lot of people want to connect with a human being. They don't just want to connect Absolutely. with a corporation or sort of faceless institution. Um, and one little funny story about the global reach of LinkedIn. I think um, at the end of a lot of my pieces, I'll put, you know, connect with me, here's my email address. So I get a lot of LinkedIn connection invites. And um, the Uber piece, when, it, when a piece goes viral, what I've noticed is it'll do well in the US for the number of hours that are in our time zone. And then right when we're going to sleep, Europe is waking up. And so the, the names of the people that would connect with me would go from like very American to then very like French and Italian and German, mm -hmm. and then Asia would get it. And so I'd be getting all these people from Asia, and then it was Australia, and then it was back to the US. So I could sort of see overnight like where people were viewing it, which I thought was cool. And do you accept all those advice from random people? I accept, I accept the vast majority of them. <laughs> and, and so uh, I am curious to hear more about in terms of uh, how, uh, uh, where you are on that spectrum as far as what comes from the official brands versus the people. Um, so, you know, we obviously have like an official, you know, university Facebook page and Twitter account and LinkedIn pages and things like that. Um, but we, for instance, for Facebook, we sign, we sign our names to our posts. We put in the, uh, the about section that these posts are coming from uh, Rebecca and Megan, um, somebody else that works on it with me. We also, um, in Twitter, you can see in the bio section tweets by, you know, at Rebecca Foss, at Megan Blue. So you can see that we're trying to make it as personal as possible. But, you know, we have to have, you know, we, we have to have a presence <laughs> as a university as well. Um, one of the things that I did when I first came to UMUC within the first couple months of being there is we, you know, one of, you know, we get a lot of questions on Twitter, for instance. So I created a Twitter account that was specifically for um, our UMUC advisor. So um, we have an at UMUC advisor Twitter account that um, someone in our advising team can answer questions directly right on Twitter. So really, and, and her face is up there, you know. <laughs> so really to, you know, connect the human, um, the human factor in with, with those things as opposed to, I have no idea who I'm talking to right now. Um, and that was a, ch a big challenge at Geico too, is like we wanted to figure out how we could, you know, make it a little bit more personal and more, hum you know, humanize it a little bit more than, hey, I'm calling into a call center and I have no idea who I'm gonna talk, or I'm going online and filling out an application, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, one thing that hasn't come up much yet today is, here at least, is video. Uh, it, how it, how important is it for you? Or, uh, any, is, uh, do YouTube or other platforms matter for any of you? Uh, uh, where what are you doing in that space? Uh, so we're B two B, and we have a great video on our website. And right now, that's the extent of our video usage. Um, I think our CEO Tom is really funny and. <laughs> So we're thinking of doing a Tea with Tom series of videos, like once a week, like five minutes or less, having him in like a smoking jacket, like, mis like masterpiece <laughs> theater style, with like a teacup, Tea with Tom. Um, we have not executed on that yet, uh, because I don't know, I, I feel like 
for me, video is more B2C. And if I was at a B2C brand, I would be advocating for that a lot more than I am. Um, I don't know whether Tea with Tom would work or not. I think it would depend a lot on what we were talking about. Uh, so I can say for our team, it's not a priority, but we are looking at it for sure. Mm -hmm. right. I, I can kind of jump in. Um, Please. The thing that's great about video, well, LinkedIn now, we offer video. We see a lot of, a lot of requests for video. People want to get you know anything from webinars to video ads to whatever it may be, um, we now have the ability to, to host those videos in stream. So when you sponsor updates, it's something that LinkedIn, you know, it's a way to push out the content. Um, you can host videos that way. So we've seen a lot of success with video marketing, um, B2B and B2C, you know, because a lot of the B2B companies are, the thing that we found, sorry, the thing that we found is that it's another source of pushing out content, essentially. So if you're a B2B marketer, um, you might want to push something out that maybe it was a webinar, maybe it was, you know, an event that you were at, maybe it was just something specific about the brand. But as long as it's something that's going to help educate a, a member on LinkedIn, anything that's out there that's going to help, you know, something that's going to help them learn or better themselves, it, you know, we've found very successful. So with the right taste, you know, it definitely works well. Mm -hmm. Rebecca. I love video. <laughs> I wish I had more video resources. Um, but I do a lot of iPhone videos now, and we post them. Uh, right around commencement time in May, we did a whole campaign for our, our, with the hashtag UMUC grad. Uh, we went around, graduated the commencement ceremonies, and interviewed people on video, and it was, we had a stream going. It was, it, it's probably my favorite time, my favorite thing that we've ever done, because it's such a, it's like the culmination of every, you know, you've, you've worked so hard, you've gotten your degree, and all these, and these families are there, like, celebrating, and it's not even about, you know, my parents are here cheering me on. It's like my kids are here cheering me on. You know, I just finished my degree. So we did, we got a lot of images and video. We use, we use Instagram for that, um, which is which is great. You know, these little 15 second videos. I love video done right. I do not like video that is too long. I mean, you, you know, and it's funny when I, when I met with YouTube, they, you know, they kind of said, well, in education, people actually do research, you know, like sort of academic materials on video, you know, like that they can watch, you know, like lectures and things like that. And we, we don't have a lot of that right now at UMUC. Um, I'd like to get some just to see, you know, and we're, we're looking at that, but I am, maybe I'm just ADD, but I cannot <laughs> sit and watch a video that's longer than like a minute. It has to be done right. It has to keep my attention. So if we're going to do video and, you know, if we're going to, you know, do things for social media, you know, my, my big fight is <laughs> with the video resources that we have is it has to look organic and they want to like, you know, stylize it and make it all, you know, like these like commercial type things. So it's really, um, for, for me, it's a resource issue. It's a push and pull. But I will take my iPhone out when I'm at events and, and shoot some video and post it just so that we can get some stuff out there. Uh, and uh, thanks. And I'll ask just a, another kind of random one, but one that fits well with LinkedIn in the room here. Just one, I mean, one of my own favorite marketing platforms is SlideShare. I mean, <laughs> heck, that's why I was uploading my previous talk SlideShare before I, I went and even gave my talk here. It's just, uh, uh, I, and and yet, I feel like that one also often falls below the radar. Uh, I, I'm curious what all three of you think about that. If if you've used it and if it's been successful at all, or what you're thinking about it these days. Yeah, we do infographics about millennials, and we always post them to SlideShare first, and then we embed that into our LinkedIn piece about it. So that the the actual reason why we did that was because we couldn't post the whole JPEG. We had to do it that way and we found really good engagement off of SlideShare. Uh, for me it's harder to it's harder to evaluate whether that's resulting in inbounds. Um, I do have everyone asking like hey how did you hear about Opia Talk? and a lot of people just can't remember. They're like oh someone forwarded me something or something. Um, we see an uptick after we post content so I know it's related to that but it's, it seems like it's usually, you know, someone saw it on SlideShare and they forwarded it to someone or it made them think of someone and so they sent it to them directly. It's not always that person saw it on LinkedIn or SlideShare. Mm -hmm. I think SlideShare is a great tool. Um, it, it is often forgotten about, you know, people don't use it as much as they should. It's, it's easy to use. It's a great place to 
store, you know, it de- I think, again, it depends on what you're doing. It's a great uh, place to store a lot of infographics, a lot of presentations. You know, if you, you know, LinkedIn obviously has, we have the ability to integrate SlideShare into the ads. You know, we have some expandable ads that actually would expand to the SlideShare presentation. Um, but you're right. I mean, a lot of people do forget about it and we'll kind of tell them to, you know, create a SlideShare account and, <laughs> and upload your information there. And it, it's, it's not in a lot of conversations, which I think it should be in more. Mm-hmm. Um, we use SlideShare. And we use it not, I mean, we don't use it for our students or to gain prospective students. We use it to establish our thought leadership in, in the higher education industry and what we're doing to innovate higher education. So we have um, a center, we, we call it, our, it's our center for, innovation, center for Innovation and Learning and Student Success. And we, um, we have a, a vice provost who goes out and does presentations and we put those on SlideShare and we send them out you know, through our social media platforms. So hey, in case you missed it, here it is. So, so you know, another one of our objectives is obviously to you know, show how we're innovating in the industry and that's a great tool for us for that. And, and so looking further out, you know, next generation of things that you know, may or may not even be totally viable marketing platforms. Say there was some conversation uh, earlier this morning about Snapchat. You know, uh, uh, I mean, marketers trying to figure out everything from secret to now breaking Ello. If any of you are swamped by those uh, invites of an absolutely pointless network, but uh, it's not my job to editorialize. <laughs> And uh, so, uh, are the, what you know? What are some emerging platforms out there that at least fascinate you? One that like you kind of want to see where it's going, or, or when you're excited to do something with? Uh, what what's kind of on the cusp that interests you right now? <laughs> <laughs> Someone else can go first. I'm thinking. Um, you know, again, our target audience is not the the Snapchat audience, <laughs> so we're not. You know, we're not really uh, looking at that. Um, we're not looking at. You know, Vi- well, I wouldn't call Vine emerging anymore, but um, you know, we're really focusing on those the, where our audiences are, and our audiences are generally on the not emerging platforms. <laughs> They're a little bit older. You know, they they think it's emerging after all the millennials have uh, have already done it. So um, so we're not really looking at, at that too much. That that's fair. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's, it's tough because a lot of what we do, you know, what I do at LinkedIn is just compared against Facebook and Twitter. You know, yeah. LinkedIn is kind of the only, I personally feel that it's the only platform like itself out there. You can't really compare LinkedIn what? to Facebook and Twitter, but any, you know, it's tough. I don't, I don't really hear about anybody talking about the emerging platforms because it's so different from LinkedIn. Well, well are there any, even outside of, say, what you're going up against mm-hmm. head to head, are there any that you think, like, I just fascinate you in some way as far as the potential for others, even if it's not in your competitive set? <laughs> I mean, there's always something new out there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I can't think of one off the top of my That's head. Fine. I was, I was, and I it's, it's not even emerging anymore. This is last year, but um, last year I looked into Viddy, which was the, <laughs> the emerging, Viddy, emerging video platform. And I thought, oh, this is going to be great, you know, and we started using it, and then it was, like, gone, you know? <laughs> I, I would just say I, I think that crowdsourcing, to me, is the most interesting trend, and I think, uh, like, I'm looking to crowdsource an article coming up for us because I didn't know that you could make a Google Doc totally open to anyone. So um, I want to do, you know, you're a millennial if, and I'm going to write to my list and say, okay, we're going to crowdsource this. Like, come up with whatever you can come up with and just upvote. Like, use a plus sign to upvote. Super simple. Um, and crowdsource an article. So I think stuff like that or crowdsourcing a video or something where a lot of people are working together at the same time is some of the coolest stuff that I think is, is going to emerge more and more. And I think there's a lot of power in that that's still untapped. Awesome. So, so what questions do you have? I mean, we've, we've got three people with a lot of varied and vast experience here and uh, people I'm excited to learn a lot from. What? Yeah, please. So I don't think you're going to give away your algorithm, but um, so I publish on LinkedIn as well and I find it interesting that I do all the things you're supposed to do, right? And, um, or that I think you're supposed to do. And then some articles will go 10,000, 12,000 views with 600, 700 likes, and then others just 
that are just as good content-wise fall flat. Um, is there, again, without giving away their algorithms, mm -hmm. uh, is, do you have any tips as far as um, being able to gain a greater reach or anything like that as far as what you publish? Person to I think it's a tough, I mean, to be honest, it's a tough question. I don't have a good answer for you. Um, okay. That's probably because I don't understand the algorithm, algorithms behind it since I'm not involved in that either. And I don't think anyone will ever understand algorithms behind the scenes. Um, I, you know, I think so when you're, if you're posting from yourself, I don't think there's a lot you could do other than focus on the content that you're doing. Um, you know, maybe there are certain keywords in there that are just, grabbing certain people that are then, you know, really pushing it out to their network. Maybe, you know, I, I think it all depends on on that. I, I don't, I wish I had a better answer for you on how to kind of really make one article go viral just like another. Um, but I just think it all depends on the content and kind of who's, you might be able to answer yeah, that. Yeah, I might be able to answer that. So one of the most frustrating things about LinkedIn is that when you post an article, um, some articles will get picked up by a channel so there's the channel social media, big ideas and innovation, small business and entrepreneurship. Um, I forget, there's, some, there's a bunch, there's like 20 at least. And um, I can tell you, I track keywords, I track a whole bunch of stuff. And um, I don't know, dude, I don't know what their algorithm is doing. I wrote a post called 10, Top 10 Marketing Tweets I've Ever Seen, which was off the hook. And Gianna, my intern, is in the audience. Thanks, girl, for helping me with that. Um, Anyway, that posted really well, but it never got picked up by the social media channel. The social media channel. It was called Top 10 Marketing Tweets I've Ever Seen. It was all about Twitter. Like, what is your algorithm doing? We said Twitter and tweet and social media like 25 times in the article. Um, and then other pieces will get picked up in random channels, like Big Ideas and Innovation. And when that happens, you can bet that article is going to do well, because it sits on that channel for, I think it never goes away, or like at least a few days. Um, so, and so, so is, is the lesson there that LinkedIn doesn't want to want you talking about Twitter? The online? lesson is I don't know what their algorithm is doing, but the 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 best I can tell you is focus on your title. Your title is the most important thing that you can possibly focus on. If people don't click it, they can't read it. They're never going to share it. It has to be a title that doesn't give away the piece. There's got to be a question like, well, what are the top ten marketing tweets? You don't already know what it's about, so don't give everything away in the title. You've got to do a little teasing. And the image. I think and the, the image, image is also huge. super important. Yeah. Um, the, we also have an editorial team um, that manages a lot of the channels. Things, <clears throat> excuse me, things over time. I mean, I've been at the company for a year and a half. I can't even explain how much content marketing has evolved. And these channels. I mean, there weren't even channels when I started. There was editorial team literally just like picking titles from certain posts and putting them in there. So now there is, you know, with, with the Pulse acquisition and, you know, everything that's going on, there is an algorithm and the editorial team manages a lot of that. Um, that could have something to do with it, but, you know, it is, it is all about the title, all about the image and all about the network that, you know, is, is reading that piece of content. For me, one thing I've noticed over my career is that focus is very important. So. That's one of the reasons I chose to focus on LinkedIn. Um, I was not that familiar with the platform when I started. I was like a lot of people and just thought of it as when I get a job, I look someone up that's at the company I want to work at and I reach out. Um, so I decided to focus on how does it really work? What, what's going on with the algorithm? What does publishing look like? What are the posts that are doing well? I did a lot of research the first, at least the first six weeks before I published, I just did research. Um, and so, and I did that, like I said, at the expense of Facebook and Twitter and SlideShare and everything else. So for me, it's a matter of literally just me as a person. How much bandwidth do I have? Am I going to scatter shot, try to put everything everywhere, or am I going to get really good at one thing and try and you know focus on that? So um, I. I put that forward to my boss. I said, this is what I want to do. Because at the beginning, we did have a Facebook and Twitter and all the rest of it. And I said, I want to basically stop content on these other channels and just focus on this one. This has been successful for us. And I think there's more successes that we could have here. And if we do our job right, we can document those successes. And then those can become future posts, which I think we're starting to get into now. 
um, because everyone on LinkedIn wants to know how to use LinkedIn as a marketing tool, and we're doing that so we can sort of double dip in that sense. I'm not sure that's the answer to the question, but I thought so it was it's a good answer. answer. Okay. Uh, I, I can get, so regarding focusing on kind of mobile, web, whatever it may be, um, I do find that a lot of clients I work with do focus on one. I think that they might be pushed from above that you need to make sure you're on mobile, web, tablet, whatever it may be. Um, one thing that we're finding is that a lot of things, you know, sponsor epics, for example, when you, we always make sure to tell it or to help the client optimize for mobile because we're actually finding that a really high percentage of our audience is coming in through mobile. Um, we actually did a really cool study where we called it coffee to couch. So, you know, you kind of find that, and this is just strictly about LinkedIn, but you kind of find that in the morning, the, the members on there, let's say their tablet or their phone, that's coffee. You kind of go through the day, you're at the office, you're on your desktop, I mean, you're, you're on the desktop. Then, you know, you go kind of commuting home or in the evening, you're now on your tablet. So we have now tried every product that we sell will go across all platforms. So everything that we do, even display, especially sponsored updates, will go across mobile, web, and tablet. Um, it kind of makes it easier for the client as well because now they're they're going, you know, we like to say you want to be everywhere that that your customer is. You want to you want to make sure that you're in front of them at all times, you know, kind of talking to them. So. Um, so right now, so I started at UMC like a little less than two years ago. Uh, we're, our biggest investment is going into redoing, in terms of digital, is going into redoing our website. And that's because it was pretty bad. <laughs> I mean, it just needed to be updated and things like that. And there's so many pages on it. Um, so, you know, I think when we started looking at different things, um, you know, in terms of our digital presence, it was like, okay, we're an online university, like we should have a more modern <laughs> and sort of updated presence. We should be on a mobile devices, we should be on tablets and things like that. I can tell you from a personal standpoint, um, everything has to go mobile. I mean, we can't, it can't just, we, if you're designing something for the web, it has to be optimized for mobile as well. I know personally, the minute I, just like you said, co uh, coffee to couch, <laughs> the minute I walk in my, my home, I never turn on my computer, I am on my tablet. So. Um, so those things have to happen, and I think that's where the future is. I mean, we can't, you know, I think a lot of companies are still, like, focusing on one part of it, but we really have to, like, start to look at it as a whole because um, the user experience is going to, you know, mm -hmm. it's going to be, it's, we're going to have to optimize that for mobile. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, so we'll have to wrap up in a sec, but before, the, what's one thing, you know, just going back to why we're all here for navigating the digital landscape. Yeah, uh, uh, what's one thing that you've learned, uh, you know, some kind of tip as far as navigating the landscape that, that you've found really helpful for doing your job better that you want to share with everyone here? Um, I guess what I would say is to have fun. Like remember to have fun because again, I come from a content marketing background and people don't want to read boring stuff. They want to read fun stuff. and. There's somewhere in your life that you have fun <laughs> and bring, bring that into your work, like um, working with other members of the team to publish now and one of the guys on our team is really into sports, so he's writing articles about sports on LinkedIn that also relate to business. So I really want my team to be engaged in what they're doing so it's not a chore. Like if content marketing feels like a chore, it's probably not going to get a lot of views because you're bored writing it, people are going to be bored reading it. Um, or video or whatever it is. So really like, you know, consider what you actually like and write about that and then figure out how to work the product into it rather than trying to make it perfect. That's my advice. Uh, I think for me it's, it's been really, I mean really staying involved in all, I would say for personally all things social. I mean there's so many things out there there's so many things, you know, coming up, and I think it's so important to learn from others. So obviously on your team, you know, you're going to have people that are older, people that are younger. There's a lot of times where, you know, the people on my team that are younger, they know a lot more than I do, and I, I'm just always wanting, I'm always wanting to learn from them, learn from, you know, even people that I don't work with, because I think that's the only way you're going to know what's out there. This is ever-evolving. I mean, this is never going to, I mean, 
this is like, I, I can't even I mean, how, explain how much it's changed from when I started on the TV side selling commercials and I, I didn't even think about anything else. You know, there was not even talk about like, make sure you're you know, advertising digitally. Um, so I think it's just always learning from others, always making sure you're aware of what's out there because there's always gonna be something that's new and exciting um, that you could just have fun and test out. And hey, Rebecca? Um, well, for me, it's really about remembering what, you know, I work in social media, that's my primary focus. So remembering what social media is really all about, you know? It's about connecting with people. It's just about people. It's just another way we communicate now. So how can we, you know, maximize that for, for businesses and companies? So when you're pushing content out there, it provides, it's fun and it provides value and that value could just be entertainment, you know, or it could be education or it could be whatever it is. But to remember that it's really about the connections between people and not, you know, it can be used for so many things, but it's really about the connections between people and developing that community of people that are your brand advocates or, you know, your, your, your engaged community, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, thank you very much, uh, Rebecca, Courtney, Melanie. This was a great learning experience for me, so uh, I hope you all took good notes and will share them with me after a big round of applause for the panel. <laughs>